I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak at this meeting celebrating the life and work of Marcel Berger. Marcel had a big influence on me. Um, I won't say more about it now because we're going to talk about it later in the afternoon. So, um, so I want to talk about some work, it's joint work with Aaron Neighbor and Wenxue Zhang, um, and it concerns the structure of non-collapsed gromov hausdorff limit spaces with Ricci bounded below, so um, two is the non-collapsing condition. Um, and so I want to discuss some results on the structure of such spaces. Uh, Various things were known, and I want to talk about the new stuff. Um, so, yeah, so HK denotes Hausdorff measure, k-dimensional Hausdorff measure, and then the, the basic result that I'll talk about today is that given such a limit space, um, you can decompose it into two pieces, one of which is r sub epsilon, the epsilon regular part. So this is not the part that's not exactly smooth, but where the tangent cones are very close to Euclidean space in particular. r sub epsilon is a manifold. Um, it's by Herder to a smooth Riemannian manifold. And the other part is the, a piece of the singular set. Um, and with just a lower bound on Ricci, the singular set could actually be dense. Singular means those points where the tangent cone is not Euclidean space, not Rn. Um, it could be dense. You could make up starting with a polygon and then put more faces on it and so on. But almost all of the singular set um, in a certain quantitative sense, the sense of the theorem, uh, the singularity is very weak. So the epsilon regular part also contains points where the tangent cone is not Euclidean space, but very close to it um, in the gromov hausdorff sense. And then the piece that's left over um, is, well, it has a certain structure. It's, uh, it was known previously from our work with Colding that it has Hausdorff co-dimension two, but now this is a much stronger statement that, first of all, this set is rectifiable. Second of all, which is four, it has a definite bound on the measure. <coughs> Let's say if you take the part lying in a ball of radius one and minus two dimensional uh, Hausdorff measure, um, has a definite bound. And more than that, a tube of radius r about uh, this s epsilon um, has a bound with the exponent r squared that you would expect if you, it was just a submanifold, a nice submanifold of co-dimension two and a Riemannian manifold. Um, uh, later in the talk, I'll uh, mention how what was just said compares to what was previously known. What was previously known was seemingly quite close, but the difference uh, between this result and what was known previously requires uh, new techniques and so on. So just to be clear about the meaning of rectifiability in this context, uh, it means for us that, say, a metric measure space is rectifiable. The measure is Hausdorff measure in this case say k rectifiable, if you can decompose it as a countable union of measurable subsets, that is decompose uh, it up to a set of measure zero, and these subsets are by Lipschitz to uh, positive measure subsets. These are the ai of r k. Okay, so it's sort of something like a manifold, but only in a measure theoretic sense. Um, and in fact, um, it wouldn't be true in the context of the previous slide that this S epsilon uh, is, a, is a manifold. Rectifiable is, is the best you can say. Um, so the background, what was known, so in work with uh, Toby Colding, we showed that 
you had such a decomposition where the Hausdorff co-dimension was indeed n minus two. Uh, dimension always means Hausdorff dimension. Uh, I should have said the Hausdorff dimension, not co-dimension. Uh, and the methodology we used, uh, we didn't really understand this, I think, when we started, but it was the classical methodology that was introduced in the context of minimal varieties by De Georgi, Federer, Fleming, and later uh, maybe uh, brought further by Omgren. Um, and, but to implement this, this idea in Riemannian geometry required uh, new techniques, which was what Toby and I developed. Uh, in a word, because you don't have a background metric. So, um, in particular, what's c constructed is a filtration of the singular set. So the singular set, that's just the set of points where the tangent cone, when you keep magnifying it and pass to a, a weak geometric limit, also known as the gromov hausdorff limit, you don't get Euclidean space. So that's the singular set, and by definition. So, uh, to repeat what I just said, a tangent cone is a pointed gromov hausdorff limit um, of some subsequence that you get by fixing a point in your limit space and blowing it up, that is rescaling the metric um, by a sequence uh, Ri inverse, which goes to infinity. So one of the basic results from the work with Toby is if you do that on a non-collapsed space, then what you'll get is a metric cone. For any, so it need not be unique in general, although of course most of the time it's just going to be Rn, but in any case, whatever you get is, is a metric cone. Uh, I'll remind you in a, of some cross-section. So here's a picture of a metric cone in two dimensions. Here's the idea that it's, this one is a limit, that is you could have convex surfaces that are closer and closer to it, and then some obvious weak geometric limit sense, weak because the cone is no longer smooth even though the manifolds in this picture had non-negative curvature. The two-dimensional surfaces is what's indicated in the picture. So now the <coughs> filtration, in this case, SK is the set of points such that no tangent cone splits off RK plus 1 isometrically. Um, this is something, if you want a picture in your head, you can think of the closed K skeleton of a simplicial complex. And then, as would be the case in that picture that is in a simplicial complex, if you thought of SK as the closed K skeleton, we would have that the dimension of SK is less than or equal to K. And this was what was shown in the uh, earlier context um, by Almgren in, um, in the sense of Hausdorff measure, and it continues to be true here. And the method classically was blow-up arguments. I mean, the cones are already defined by blow-up in the sense of this rescaling and passing to uh, gromov hausdorff limit in this case. And uh, to obtain this dimension inequality, the, dim the dimension bound SK has dimension at most K, um, you need to do iterated blow-ups. So what's the point of doing a blow-up? So <laughs> the point of these arguments, they're arguments by contradiction. So there's a part that comes in from geometric measure theory. Um, it'll be said in a little more detail on the next uh, slide. And uh, the point is to show, it's an argument by contradiction. You want to show this dimension bound. And you, what you try to show is if it were not true, it would not be true for some cone. A cone is a more special object than a general limit space, so um, that's helpful. Um, and the cones always in this context, including the original context, minimal services, harmonic maps, or here, they exhibit radial invariance. So we'll kind of say in a while where this comes from. 
but a cone, obviously. So I mean a cone with an arbitrary cross-section, which means geometrically I take these scaled copies and I stack them <coughs> on top of each other. They exhibit radial invariance, and in our context, more specifically, what it means, a cone is the formula for the distance in polar coordinates. So it, it, it's topologically R plus cross something, uh, the cross section, which could be any metric space in principle. And the distance squared is given by the law of cosines. That's what I call a metric cone. Some people call it a Euclidean cone. And in this context of limits with Ricci bounded below, the diameter is at most pi. And in fact, you can think since the cone is a blown up limit space and blowing up, rescaling by a large constant makes the lower bound smaller. So in some general sense, the cones have non-negative curvature in some limiting generalized sense, and therefore the cross-section of the cone should have curvature, Ricci curvature I'm talking about, bounded by n minus 1 times the metric, just as it would be when the cone is Euclidean space and the cross-section is the unit sphere. <coughs> and then that's consistent with this, uh, with this result that the, uh, I always get into trouble with this. I think I'll just use these arrows. Okay, so the bound on the diameter by Meyer's theorem uh, is consistent with the idea that the cone, the cross section should have diameter, uh, should have curvature uh, bounded below by n minus one. Um, in fact, this also, strictly speaking, comes from the splitting theorem, with, without which it wouldn't even be clear the cross section was connected. Okay, so. Why is this helpful in proving the inequality is because any point on the cone except the vertex lies on a ray, which is in the sense of Riemannian geometry, I have infinite geodesic going out to infinity, each segment of which is minimal. So if I take a point other than the vertex lies on a ray, now suppose I blow up again. Now the ray becomes a line and if you like, by the splitting theorem, um, the line splits off isometrically. So we can keep doing this iterated blow up, always avoiding the set of vertices. Now, we did it once, the original, we get something across a line. So whatever vertex was in the non-line factor, now everything on here is a vertex. But if we avoid it, we can keep blowing up again. Now, the geometric measure theory is just a density argument said if we had, if the inequality failed to begin with, it would fail for a generic point on one of these blown up cones. And then by iteration, again, it would fail. But eventually, we split off our k plus 1. And then every tangent cone uh, on such a thing that splits off RK plus 1, of course, would also split off RK plus 1. And then the fact that this SK was non empty, but that consisted of things that don't split off RK plus 1. And so we would have reached a contradiction. So that's how the iterated blow ups go. Now, the next thing I want to say, because it's important to say it, is why are tangent cones metric cones? So we can look at the volume ratio um, up here, where this point is in this simply connected space, of curvature identically equal to h, say some hyperbolic space, for example. And this is the volume ratio. And uh, <coughs> this ratio as a function of r is uh, if we fix h, right, is going to be monotone decreasing, a priori bounded, uh, that is, it starts out in the limit as r goes to zero. Uh, it, um, in the smooth case, it just becomes one because manifolds are infinitesimally Euclidean. But if we go out to, let's say, r equals one, the non-collapsing assumption just says that it's bounded below. So it's bounded above by one and bounded below by something involving this v that we assumed in our non-collapsing. And then there's a third thing which is crucial, which I call uh, 
coercivity and will be explained uh, on the slide after this one. So the monotonicity, that's just the Bishop Grom of inequality. Um, the boundedness, as I mentioned, is just the non-collapsing assumption. And the last point is uh, something we proved with uh, Toby, the, the thing I'm calling coercivity. This um, refers to the almost equality case of, the, of Bishop Gromov. So first, the equality case, which is much easier and was probably understood that this ratio, um, <coughs> which is monotone, the script V sub H, suppose first that actually it didn't change at all as a function of R. Well then, as in earlier results in uh, Riemannian geometry, the proof can be by a string of inequalities, and each of which would have to be an equality if, if it didn't change in the end. And then you see that it must be a cone. Actually, strictly speaking, in the Riemannian case, it would have to be smooth. But if instead of the volume of the ball, you used the corresponding thing, the volume of the, the n minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of the ball, and you assumed that that ratio, which is also monotone, didn't change between two fixed values of r, then the conclusion would be that it has to look like um, an annulus. So here I'm, I mean, strictly speaking, an annulus in a cone. Now when I say that, I'm assuming the lower bound is zero. But since we're talking about rescaling and small balls in the limiting case, it's just as if the lower bound is really zero in, in our context, and otherwise it would be um, whatever it was in the warp product with warping function, like uh, in the space of constant curvature h. So the coercivity, however, um, says that something much stronger is true, namely what happens if it's almost constant on some interval, that is this thing which is monotone, then in the gromov hausdorff sense we're almost in the situation of an annulus, or depending on what we're saying, if we're the volume and we're in a limit space where it actually could be a cone, then we almost have a cone. Now this turned out uh, not just to be a matter of following the string of equalities and imagining what would happen if each one were almost an equality, it um, really needed new ideas, which will be mentioned presently. Um, but this is true, and this kind of stability, um, if you have the, almost the hypothesis, you have almost the conclusion, uh, t is, is, is much, much stronger, as we'll see. Um, so now we, let's make a normalization, may as well, after an initial scaling, say h is, say, minus n minus 1, that of n-dimensional hyperbolic space. I think I meant here h is h is probably minus 1 is what I meant, which means the lower bound on Ricci is minus n minus 1, so that's a slight misprint. Um, and let's call something of the form 2 to the minus j a scale. So now, um, if we think about it, we have this quantity, it's a function of r, and let's evaluate it on each scale. Well, it's pinched between 1 and this constant that comes from the non-collapsing, but there are infinitely many scales in between <coughs> 2 to the minus n equals 0 and 2 to the 0, which is 1. But because of the monotonicity on almost all of them, it hardly changes at all, um, right? Because it's like a, a series where all the terms are positive and uh, it's bounded and there are infinitely many terms, so all but a definite amount are extremely small. And therefore, we're in the situation when it's small of it's almost looking like a cone. So strangely, in my opinion, this idea, uh, probably the equality case was understood, and the almost equality case, which is non-trivial to prove, at least could have been guessed earlier in the game, and then if you just thought about it, you would see this picture.
the Im implication being that on almost every scale, all apart from a definite number in a quantitative sense, <coughs> the ball must look like, to the naked eye like a cone after magnification. So this really could have been done had anyone thought to do it. I mean, not proved, but at least conjectured, but I don't think that actually anyone did that. Um, okay. So now I want to emphasize a certain point that is going to uh, come important in the rest of the talk, and that is that in order that we needed this effective estimate, which was what I was calling coercivity, and the one place where that's used is in, pa is in passing the estimates on smooth manifolds under this weak convergence to <coughs> tangent cones. So you need that, for example, to com conclude that tangent cones of limit spaces are, are metric cones. You need the qualitative version. So you have an effective estimate, and I gave one uh, consequence of it, that on most sc scales it looks very close to a cone. You can't tell which ones are bad, but you can tell there are only so many bad ones. And yet, here, when you say the, the conclusion is that all cones are tangent cones, that's an infinitesimal conclusion from an effective estimate. So this suggests that the effective part isn't being completely used. Um, so then here at the bottom is just the remark that there's also an effective version of the uh, splitting theorem, which in the non-effective case for non-negative curvature uh, we did with Grimaud, and uh, it does apply to even possibly collapse tangent cones because they have non-negative Ricci in a generalized sense. Okay, so now let's, I said earlier that in fact in the non-collapse case the singular set had co-dimension two, which was part of our work with Toby. And how would you prove something like that? Well, it's really part of this general methodology that went back to the minimal surface or minimal varieties uh, story, and in fact the most famous version of that, I would say, was what was eventually concluded by Jim Simons that's minimizing hypersurfaces. The singularities are co-dimension seven. So the point is that once you know that if you have any singularities, then the tangent cone and a singularity must be an actual cone, then you can ask yourself, well, what kind of cones might I have? So they have to split off a certain Euclidean factor, the ones you're interested in, so what could they be? And uh, so in our case, if you want to show the singular set has co-dimension two, then you say, well, if I had a cone which split off Rn minus one, what could it be? Well, uh, the cross-section has to be either two points or one point. Uh, it can't be three points. It would contradict the splitting theorem. So it's really Rn minus one cross a line, in which case it isn't singular at all, so we don't have to worry about that case. Or it's R plus cross Rn minus one, that is to say, a half space. Now, the point is, if you think about it, so the half space is a perfectly good cone, right? Line, this is a cone on a point, whose cross section at a point, cross this. This is a perfectly good cone, but our question is, can it arise as a limit space? And the answer is no. And the reason why, if you think about it, so the point, when we say a pointed limit, the point is over here on the boundary. Right, so a ball then looks like this half of, uh, of a ball, right? It has a boundary in here, but on the other hand, the balls of which it's a limit don't have any boundary in there. The boundary is out there, so there's something wrong with this picture. And that you can make into a proof. So there's a perfectly good cone, but it doesn't arise as a limit space. That was the... And, and that's always, there was the same thing with Simon's uh, 
you know, he showed the, the, the geometric measure theory technology said you would, the cone you would get if you had singularities had to be minimizing. Simons with the Simons equation showed how to uh, deform it to something smaller, with smaller area. And so it couldn't have arisen in that way. Uh, it was a perfectly, it would be a perfectly good cone over a compact minimizing smooth thing in the sphere by induction, but he showed it up to the appropriate dimension where it turned out not to be true anymore, that you could deform it to something smaller, and that was the proof is the same idea here. Okay, so some of the, so I said that in the Riemannian case, it wasn't just a matter of following a string of ODE inequalities. You really needed new techniques in the work with Toby. And some of them were involved a particular kind of regularization, the idea being that distance functions are the natural functions in Riemannian geometry. And of course, in Euclidean space, they might be smooth, in fact, a coordinate function in Euclidean space, or maybe in a Riemannian product, would be a harmonic function, uh, even with constant norm of the gradient, or distance squared from a point, Laplacian of that would be constant and equal to 2n. So. Uh, but on a Riemannian manifold, of course, distance functions need not be smooth on the, the cut locus. So the idea was to approximate them by the solutions of these equations uh, with, on the region you're looking at, the same boundary values, and then measure how close the solution of the elliptic equation was to the corresponding distance function on your manifold. The point of this approximation is that these guys actually are smooth, and you have control of things like the pointwise norm of the gradient by the Cheng Yao estimate, and Bachner's formula gives you L2 control of the Hessian. And then you can pass those results to um, control of the uh, first derivative part uh, that you, you wouldn't have otherwise in the form of integral estimates initially. So you can use the regularized thing to get some kind of integral estimates on the actual distance function uh, that are the relevant ones for the geometry. And then there was were techniques, the basic technique for turning the integral estimates uh, into the estimates on to actual distance estimates. And uh, that involves something, for instance, called the segment inequality. So that was some of what was in the paper with Toby, a uh, considerable amount of the import, important part. And now there was also something about two-sided bounds. So suppose you now, ha in addition to the lower bound, you assume you have an upper bound on the Ricci curvature. An upper bound is not significant in and of itself, but if you, it, it adds something basically because uh, you have more regularity um, when you assume it in addition to a lower bound. So there had been a co- uh, a conjecture going back to the 90s, in due to Mike Anderson and probably some of the earlier pioneers like um, Gong Tian and maybe Nakajima, that the singular set in the case of a two-sided bound, uh, it actually occurs in Mike Anderson's ICM talk, uh, should have co-dimension four rather than co-dimension two. And eventually we were able to prove this uh, with Aaron Neighbor, it stayed open for a long time. So it was understood, here's what was understood here, maybe i just take a minute. So using the same sort of idea as I just explained over there, uh, 
Now suppose with the two-sided bound you wanted to show the singular set had co-dimension four. Well, it, it was actually understood if you could show it had co-dimension three, uh, there was a topological argument you could show then that it had co-dimension four. So what it then came down to was ruling out a tangent cone like this. So here's the paper cup cone cross Rn minus two, and you had to show this couldn't arise as a limit space. Okay. This perfectly good cone was not a limit space with a two-sided bound on Ricci. Now in dimension two, of course, it's kind of obvious that uh, it can't, but with the right from this, this picture, but um, to show that this can't arise as a limit space with Ricci zero because of the blowing up part uh, turned out to be quite hard, but there was a t rather technically difficult argument. We were eventually able to do that. So this was the easy part in going from three, that was the hard part in going from three to four was known to be easy if you could get co-dimension three. So now also in 2012 some new ideas came in uh, in the work with Aaron and that returns to the point I mentioned earlier that if you have effective results like this what I was calling coercivity the this function monotone almost constant means you're close to a cone in the gromov hausdorff sense, you would like to make more use of that. And uh, that's what we pointed out in this 2012 paper, or realized, maybe I should say, that you are in fact able to do. So in the co-dimension four with the two-sided bound, um, what we showed was that the singular set, you actually had an estimate on the tubular neighborhood, which is stronger than a bound on the Hausdorff dimension. And so it had co-dimension four, but what we showed there is that, um, so where are we here? Okay. This is probably going to continue to happen because it happens to me in every talk. Um, so notice, if this were a smooth co-dimension four manifold, then the volume of a tube around it would look like this, but without the eta and without the eta over here. It would just be four and, f and a constant. So we almost showed that in the sense that we showed for any constant the tube would look like this. And this was the first result of this type, which just wasn't something about the Hausdorff dimension. But there was this annoying point that the constant in front of the estimate blew up as eta went to zero. Right. So it seems like a small thing, but it actually turned out to require totally new ideas to get rid of it, which I'll come to at the end. So then the corresponding thing um, is uh, in the co-dimension four case that you get a bound on, see, so suppose you're outside, maybe let me just say it in words, I forget what might be on the next slide. So here's the bound on this tube around the singular set. But what this says in effect is if you're not in the tube, namely your distance r away, then you have a definite bound on the Riemannian curvature. Not just at the point that you're looking at, but on a ball of comparable radius <coughs> around that point. So this is the soup on a ball outside the tube again with this annoying eta, but nonetheless. So this is much stronger than just having a bound on the center. Um, for example, um, so, so this was a kind of new take on, on this, this subject, uh, not just Hausdorff measure bounds. And the idea being that if you have this soup bound and you have some equation, and these are all equations 
right? The same kind of story held in all of these cases, uh, partly joint. Um, then <coughs> when you have an elliptic estimate and you have this sort of soup bound, you rescale it to unit size and then you get bounds on all the higher derivatives automatically, the appropriate bounds. So for example, in the harmonic map case where the a priori bound from the definition was an L2 bound on the norm of the gradient, which you assumed, then this led to an L3 bound. Um, uh, sorry, an LP bound for every P less than three, and LP is actually wrong. Um, so the idea both of the tube controlling the size of the tube and a definite amount of regularity in this sense over here outside of the tube. So this we call this the regularity scale, sometimes called the curvature scale. That's uh, the thing where you, you have such a bound with the two there um, is a crucial part of the discussion and has applications. And the way that certainly I came to this was in work with Bruce and Asaf Noor in a very different context. Um, and there was earlier work um, using this, this uh, the ideas of uh, something like this um, by Doran Soro, Jones, Jones, Sims, and Ribe, each in a very different context from what I'm talking about here. And the point about this, in my opinion, is that this, this work that I'm talking about here stems from, is, is from the 80s. But the most elementary case of it just applies to a function of one variable with a bound on its derivative. And then you look at all dyadic intervals and you ask yourself for a given epsilon, what's the sum of the lengths on which this function after magnification to unit size, like if you looked at it under a microscope, is not epsilon close to being linear. Now, the linear function is not its derivative, it's just the best linear approximation. So one way of saying that a function is, is differentiable is, right, like the Earth is flat. One way of saying it is if you look at it under a microscope, it starts looking like it's tangent line. But if all you know is a bound on the first derivative, you might have a function, say, with a high frequency but small amplitude, and uh, if the frequency is high enough and the amplitude is small enough, it still has derivative bounded by one, and this guy, although it doesn't look like it's tangent line until you go to an extremely small scale, it does look like a linear function most of the time, and that linear function is zero because the amplitude is, you know, that is, it's a constant linear function. So that's the, the idea. And this, this simple idea was somehow not taught to undergraduates, which I think it should be. And therefore, um, in these more advanced contexts, stemming from the 60s, the kind of results I'm talking about here were missed. It wasn't understood because most people have made a survey of various uh, very distinguished analysts, and they've never heard of what I just told you over here. So it's an interesting sociological point. So now uh, we started a little late. I'm not sure how much time I have. How much time do I have? Yeah, about 15 more minutes, I think. 15, great, okay. So, so here are the new techniques that were used in the work with Aaron that I've described up to this point. But this, this technique is what you need to get the result, but still with this minus eta and the coefficient depending on eta. So there's a quantitative version of the stratification, or what I call the filtration, which I'll come to, a quantitative version of what I call cone splitting. I'll explain what that is. Something called the energy decomposition, a certain covering argument which is not so difficult, and novel e epsilon regularity theorems. So now I want to explain what these terms refer to. <coughs> 
So this was in the work with Aaron from 2012. So we want to take this filtration and just make a more effective definition. Some people believed that that's all we did was make a definition, but I beg to <laughs> differ with them. <laughs> okay, so let's introduce some parameters into the SK, we call it SK epsilon, and that means a point is in SK epsilon R if uh, we look at the interval, say, between R and 1, and we say no ball on its own scale is epsilon close, so that's what this means. On its own scale is epsilon close to splitting off. Uh, yeah, is k symmetric, but really what I want is it's not k plus 1 symmetric up to an error of epsilon on its own scale. The r means on its own scale. Okay, so then that's a quantitative version. So all balls down to radius r have to not be epsilon close on their own scale to splitting off an rk plus 1 factor isometrically. And then it's easy to see that if this happens down to zero, the intersection of all of these is just the ones where tangent cones are epsilon away let's say, on a ball of size 1 uh, from splitting off uh, rk plus 1. In fact, this is, this is the, eps this, this, this is the S <coughs> epsilon k, where k is n minus 2 that appeared on the very first transparency. And then the, well, or maybe this one, I think there shouldn't be, yeah, this is a misprint. There shouldn't be an epsilon there. Okay, it's the union of these epsilons. Okay, so the whole singular set, uh, the kth element of the filtration. Okay, so these things are, are very easy to check, but nonetheless fundamental. They allow you to introduce these quantitative ideas. So now, the other, another ingredient was cone splitting, and by that I mean the following. So first, in a version of this uh, actually occurred in this earlier uh, work, say, on harmonic maps. You can find it. There are some notes, for example, by Leon Simon from these, uh, whatever they're called, at, uh, at Utah, um, where they have these uh, summer schools, whatever. There are some nice notes and a very nice one-line explanation in the context of functions of the point. I'm going to just explain geometrically. So in our context, if you take a cone and cross it with, let's say, a Euclidean space, it's still a cone. And moreover, if this was your original cone, let's say two-dimensional, any point, of course, since it's an isometric product, is now a vertex, right? So you can regard it as a cone. It has a whole n minus 2 of vertices once you cross it. The converse is also true. That's, that's the point here, that if you have something, a space, and you can regard it as a cone in two different ways, that is where the vertices are distinct, then it actually must split off a line. By a cone, I mean a metric cone. must actually split off a line isometrically, and the two ways, you re the two cross-sections of your cones are, are isometric. So I would call that cone splitting. Right? If I have a space, I can regard it as a cone in two distinct ways, then uh, it must split off a line isometrically, must go through the two vertices. And this is, the iter this is the iterated version of it, so that's cone splitting. So then, as you might expect, since we're emphasizing the effective version, another ingredient is an effective version of cone splitting. So it means if the cones are almost cones, and we almost have these, these vertices where the points are separated, then it almost splits off. So you could you know, just fill in what it would have to uh, mean. It's an effective version of the previous statement. Um, and uh, this is, now this maybe is worth saying. Uh, 
so you could check this. Where, what am I talking about here? So I have, uh, I have these points which look like they're vertices up to a small error. And now I'm saying I can actually find this regularized coordinate function by taking the difference of, um, so if it's going to split off a line, for example, so just think of the following illustration of what's supposed to be on this, and then just look in the plane. So that splits off the x-axis, never mind about the y-axis for the moment. You take these two points, say 1, 0, uh, minus 1, 0. Now look at the squared distance from each of these. So this one is maybe the r naught. This one is r1 over there. So, so what we're looking at is now x squared minus 1 minus x squared plus 1. And if I divide it by 4, I should just get x, which is the coordinate. That's what this refers to up here. So that's an analytic version, again, of what, what I was talking about over there. So the difference of squared distance functions is illustrated over there, and that's, that's what's occurring over here. So So this is now actually a generalization of what was on the initial transparency. Namely, the initial transparency was the, the case of this, but for the whole singular set, because the whole singular set was really Sn minus 2. So something similar, actually, this is saying something similar is true for all of these quantitative strata of the singular set. So that's true more generally. The thing that's special, say, to the n minus 2 or n minus 4, if you have the two-sided bound, is the regularity outside of it. So, and then, and also the bound on the measure because of the regularity outside. So this is just really a generalization, basically, of what was on the first transparency. But without the rectifiability statement from the first transparency and uh, with the eta in there. Okay. And so I just, I won't be able to say what's involved in getting rid of the eta except maybe a word or two. It's too technical. But I will say a little bit more about uh, how we arrived at this with the eta uh, using the ideas which have been explained so far. So in particular, what I said early on was that there was a bound on the number of scales where it, it wouldn't look like a cone. On everything else, it looks as close to a cone as, as you want, and, and that wasn't made full use of um, in the earlier work. So, so now here's the thing. So there, there's something which in the 2012 work with Aaron, which we called the energy decomposition. And it simply was, so we fix an epsilon, and then we fix a point, and then we make a record of the scales such that it doesn't look on that scale within an epsilon error on its own scale like a, like a cone. So at every point, there are some bad scales, but only a definite number. But the, the bad scales, which ones they are, depends on the point, right? So I can't say from point to point which are the bad scales, only that there are a definite number having fixed, at most a definite number having fixed epsilon. So what we did was we can, if we wish, group together all of the points where um, they have the same good and bad scales, right? Now, if you think about it, no matter how far down I go, so I'm, I'm taking some finite r from the previous transparency, but it could be extremely small. But yet, the number of bad scales, if I fix epsilon, is bounded. So the fact that it's bounded means, if I think of these collections, 
of points which have the same good and bad scales, it's not as bad as you would think um, because it can only grow, so to say, polynomially, the collections. It would be quite different if I were grouping them together and I didn't have an a priori bound on the number of bad scales, then there would be many more groups is what I'm saying. But here, they're only growing polynomially. That's this n to the q, the number of groups, because I have n scales, but only a definite number independent of n are bad. So they're only roughly n to the q possibilities for the number of groups. So that's a crucial point. Okay, now why do I want to group them together? Because of the following two things. When I'm on a good scale and I look at all those points, if they're close together and they look very conical, then I will have this idea that it almost splits off a line. Okay, if they're separated, you know, fairly close together, they look very conical, then that will mean the geometry splits off a line. See, if not, be considering both points where it looked good and maybe other points where it looked bad. So that's why I want to, at least on the good scales, which is almost every scale, then I get this kind of line splitting or Euclidean splitting. So I want to use that in a covering argument and there'll be finitely many bad scales and then I'll be able to do a very cheap kind of covering on that scale. So to get the estimate on the volume um, of the tube, um, so here it kind of says on the good scales, the set we're trying to cover will look like if we're talking about SK, a k-dimensional Euclidean factor, namely this where it's k-dimensional and the set I'm trying to cover will look very near to this. So I roughly need only half to, uh, two to the k balls to cover it and go down to the next scale. On a bad scale, it's not close to a k-dimensional thing, but I can cover it with two to the n balls, where n is the dimension, and they're only finitely many, so that will just put a constant in front of the whole estimate. Also, because there are so few uh, of the groups, right, because of the a priori bound, to deal with the whole thing, um, I can fix my attention on one group and then just add the estimates because it, it, it's true there are, inf there are infinitely many, but much smaller. It's, it will be absorbed into the, the eta. So that's kind of the idea, and so this is just saying the same thing again in words that you, the covering argument to estimate this uh, size of the uh, quantitative uh, stratification or filtration, I, I cover and then I recover with balls of half the size and so on, and if you think of it, I'm trying, I'm sort of covering the thing by a generalized Cantor set. You can think of it in that way, where on, when I go from one scale to the next, which is almost every time, having fixed a particular collection of good and bad scales, then I only need, when I go down a scale, uh, if it's L less than K, the worst case would be K, I only need two to the L balls of half the radius, whereas on the bad scales, I just recover the whole ball. That's a factor of two to the n, but I only have k of those, so it just puts something in, in the constant, and that's how the proof goes. And then there's a kind of soft epsilon regularity theorem which tells you that outside of the tube, um, when you're at the top stratum, uh, you really, uh, um, it's really regular. So in what, what this would say in words would be that, let's say we have the two-sided Ricci bound case where the singular set has co-dimension four. So singular point is allowed to split off Rn minus four, but if we're at a point where it's sufficiently close to splitting off Rn minus three on a ball then it must be smooth. That's the relevant epsilon regularity theorem. 
let's let's imagine it's Einstein. So, it, but it's the same. It's really the same, just with C one alpha, C one alpha regularity. If it, Ricci is bounded, so it's a kind of actually relatively soft epsilon regularity theorem. If it has enough symmetry, the tangent cone, then it must absolute. Then it must actually be smooth. This is where you have an equation which corresponds in, in words to a two-sided bound. And this is a, a contradiction, compactness, where the compactness is in a weak topology and the equation, meaning the Ricci formula in harmonic coordinates in this case allows you to get back over the weak convergence as in the blow-up arguments that were introduced by Mike Anderson. So. Uh, now, <coughs> I don't know, what do I have, a minute or two, or I'm done? Uh, actually, I looked at my schedule, uh, yeah? it's a bit over time. What? Take I'm over time. It's fine. Take I know, but I know I started late. Uh, <laughs> 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 this I kept careful track of. So, in, okay, in the last minute or, or two, I just want to say, what could be the source, what, where could this eta come from? What was lost in this argument? Well, mainly the idea is when you do the recovering, maybe the balls stick out a little bit and something is lost there. You can't quite cover a ball by balls of half the size, but you could probably get away with that by being more careful about the domains, not balls, but what are sometimes called crisp cubes or something like this. But the energy decomposition, which was so pleasing when it was discovered, is actually a source of uh, the error. At worst, you would still have a, a, a logarithmic error, Let's say log r instead of in front of the r to the fourth, log r to some power um, from this energy decomposition, because the idea was you did have quite a few of these groups that I was denoting script c, just the, it, they weren't growing fast enough so they could be absorbed by the eta. So you really need a different idea to get rid of them, get rid of the eta. And in a way, you could think at a completely formal level that, um, as I said before, you can imagine you have a series of positive terms and the sum is some definite C. Well, the first thing, which was the non-effective estimates about tangent cones, is the first observation is this implies eta n goes to zero. The second observation is, well, actually, by Markov's inequality, there can only be a definite number of terms, since you know C, uh, which um, this probably should have a C in front of the uh, x inverse, okay. But a definite number of terms that can be only so big if you have a bound on the total. But still, that statement is weaker than simply what you started with, was that the, the sum of all the terms was C. So to get rid of the eta, you have to somehow take advantage of, in our context, that the sum of the terms is C, and not just this, which leaves you with the eta. And this is possible, but uh, certainly not easy. So. There's a paper by Neighbor and Daniele Valtorta that introduced some new tools. One to deal with the rectifiability, which we also, of course, didn't know, um, was a Reifenberg-type rectifiability theorem, uh, which uh, much weaker hypotheses than previous ones, and um, a very non-trivial covering argument as well. And also the context, the concept of what's called a neck decomposition, which uh, I won't have time to say anything about. Initially, I thought I might, but then I decided it was hopeless. Um, and then they proved this uh, in the context of harmonic maps. They got rid of the eta, and they proved uh, minimal varieties of harmonic maps, and they. they prove rectifiability and got rid of the eta, which was still left from our previous work. And then a really remarkable paper in the Riemannian geometry context, but assuming a two-sided bound by Neighbor and Wenxue Zhang, where they proved again the rectifiability, this time in the context of the two-sided bound. So, and moreover, this 
tube type bound, which is much stronger, R to the fourth, no eta, and completely remarkably, an a priori L2 bound on the curvature. So from we, we had done this in the work with Aaron in dimension four, where the singular set consisted of points, and uh, we had done it in general, but with the, the eta. And, uh, and one reason why this is particularly remarkable is in the other contexts of harmonic maps and so on, this is not true. What you get is it's in uh, weak L4. As a we, the earlier result was in LP for every P less than four. That was from the work of Aaron and myself. And the harmonic maps uh, and so on, it's in weak L3, but here it's actually in curvature in L2. So that's special to the Riemannian case. So this is a very fundamental, remarkable result, in my opinion. And the last thing I want to say is that so now what I was talking about today was the case where you just have a lower bound and this actually requires completely new estimates from the two-sided bound one because they used in an essential way something they called a super convexity estimate which doesn't hold with just a lower bound. So the neck decompositions uh, certainly play a crucial role. I didn't get to say what they were but uh, it requires new estimates and something in place of the Reifenberg argument, which used a more canonical version having to do with harmonic splitting functions and their behavior on neck regions, and in particular a sharpening of something that played a key role in the 2015 paper with, with Aaron, something called the transformation theorem. So. Okay, I'll stop here. Are there any questions? Yes. Is there any chance that your main theorem characterizes non collapsing uh, from Faustoff limits among uh, metric measure spaces with lower Ritchie curvature bound? try to make sense out of what you're asking. Uh, maybe you could ask it a little more precisely. That would help me. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'm just not so thinking clearly. <laughs> so it characterizes them am among what? So uh, it's every metric measure space with a low? No, I don't think that that's right. I think um, that, uh, you know, there is a synthetic theory of Ricci bounded <coughs> below. And I think it definitely, I mean, uh, which includes as an assumption the fact that it's inf infinitesimally Euclidean as opposed to F Finsler, but I think, it's, I think it's a stronger condition. Actually, there may be another thing that one could say in this context that's relevant. So there, well, all right. So first of all, there is a th synthetic theory, which is kind of closer to what I think you're asking. And also after, almost 20 years, 17 or something, of this synthetic theory <coughs> finally starting to prove structural results as opposed to just more and more inequalities, which was something I advocated for quite a while. So without answering your question precisely, I suspect if I understood it, the answer would probably be no. But um, anyway, something is coming closer to what you asked, I feel. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, can you improve your results if you replace the Ricci bound by bounds on the sectional curvature? Yeah. Um, I think then. Well, let's see. I mean, uh, well, the bound, the 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 lower bounds. I mean, the two-sided bound, of course, then there's the whole theory of bounded curvature, and then you would have compactness where the limits would be 
smooth if they were non-collapsed and collapsing theory. If but um, well, I mean, certain things are true, like tangent cones are unique. Um, but uh, so you can in certain ways, but I think in certain ways it kind of resembles the the Ricci case also. I mean, definitely there are some stronger statements. Um, and they're not my results. I mean, there's, there's a theory of uh, Alexandro spaces. So. Um, maybe Karsten uh, is a person to, to ask. But it, it, it's, it's rather similar in a way. I mean, one crucial point, of course, is tangent cones are unique. And you have strainers, and there's this whole discussion there. Any other questions? Thank you, speaker, again.